So things are really starting to look good here on the project. We've been uh, getting a lot of things done and we're actually really excited for what's to come. The next couple of things are going to be putting up the bow assembly and the stern assembly. But if you remember correctly in the last episode, we just finished the forward deadwood as well as the worm shoe and we finished up with uh, milling. So at this point, there's one more thing that we need to do before we can really start working on putting the stem together. And that is gonna be putting all this wood away. So for starters, if you haven't seen the last episode, it's definitely one to watch. Our friend James from the JT Milling came in with his LT70 wood miser mill and we ended up milling 10,000 board feet of lumber in two days. That mill was impressive to watch in action. But although he was giving us a good deal, we knew that it was gonna be expensive nonetheless. So our plan was to stack all of our lumber in one big pile, quick and dirty, knowing full well that we were gonna have to sort and stack it properly afterwards. And that actually ended up taking us three days, which was actually longer than milling. Having easy access to your lumber and being able to sort through it is a really important part of the process of boat building. So what we did is we sorted all of our lumber into individual piles. Makes sense, right? Behind me, you can see all the dimensional lumber. One aspect of the build that we had completely underestimated was how much dimensional lumber we were gonna need for different types of construction projects throughout the build. That can be seen in all the lumber that we use for the ballast keel mold. We're also gonna need some to build scaffolding up the sides of Arabella once it gets too high for us to work. So for example, while we're planking, but there are so many other reasons to have dimensional lumber around. You never know when you're gonna need it. So thinking ahead, what we did was we cut a lot of the pine and the hemlock into four by fours, two by fours, and two by eights. Thinking that any of those could be either resawn or used as is and be perfect for whatever project we needed to do around here. A lot of the pine that we cut down was actually too nice for dimensional lumber. And trust me, on a property like this, there is a lot of nice pine. So a lot of this clear pine we milled for the interior cabinetry as well as for the decking. This is what was milled two years ago um, and is now pretty dry and great. And what's behind me is what we just milled in our last session. And yes, we understand that a lot of you have concerns about pine as laid decking, but please keep it constructive and clean in the comments below. Thanks. So behind me here is a little bit more of the more interesting lumber. So all of this behind me is the black locust that got donated to us by our friend at Earthworm Landscaping. And all the way on the end over there is the spruce that we took down in one of the previous episodes. It's a good one. And if you remember right, that tree was planted by Steve's great grandfather way back in the day. These boards will be laminated together to make our main mast. Since Victoria was a cutter, her main mast, which looks in pretty good condition, will likely be good enough for us to shave down to make our mizzen mast. So in New England, not much is out there that beats black locusts in terms of density and rot resistance. So we're looking to use it for some of the high wear parts of the boat. So the dead eyes, the Samson post, the rub rails, things like that. And like I said, extremely dense wood. This is actually the culprit that may have broken my foot. I say may because we still don't have health insurance, so I never went and got it checked out. But yes, I was wearing boots. Um, but however, it landed from about four feet high on the bridge of my foot and probably cracked it. I'm not really sure. Just kept the boot on for the rest of the day. And then I ended up putting it in a medical boot and kept off of it for, I don't know, maybe a week or two, something like that. And I just babied it. It's fine now, let's move on. Lumber storage has been a bit of an issue. We've just put tarps on it and then it rains and it's all kind of a nightmare. And we've been wanting to set up something a little bit more permanent. 
Uh, so we built this structure and we hinged where the rafters meet the ridge pole and we hinged the posts here as well. So right now the tarp is in upward mode so that we can bring the wagon in and stack lumber. And then once that's done, we can just grab the post, take this board off, pick it up and set it down and take the roof from something almost flat to something more pitched. And that'll help shed all the rain. So since we have good weather and we're coming in and out, it's in the up position right now. And then come winter, we'll have to go through and unscrew the tarp. It's screwed through the grommets and just put the tarp on the wood pile because there's no way this thing's going to support a snow load. But for a good majority of the year, it's going to give us awesome lumber coverage and allow us to get access to the lumber a lot easier, which is really big, especially since we're going to have so much big, beautiful oak to stack up in season. Freshly cut lumber is referred to as green lumber. It is heavy with moisture and is usually not considered to be applicable for most situations. The reason for this is that when it dries out of a controlled environment, it can have the tendency to warp and check, which is why it's important to set up a stable and level place to store it while it dries. Making sure it dries evenly is also very important, and that is where the stickers which we mentioned in the last video come into play. Stickers are placed between layers to allow for even airflow. Finally, boards should be relatively clean when put away. Sawdust on boards can attract bugs, especially carpenter ants. The ants don't eat the wood, but they do make their nests in it, and this enhances the decay of the wood. One thing most people may not realize is how heavy these boards are. They're deceptively heavy, especially green and full of moisture, easily hundreds of pounds each. So we had to work slowly and meticulously, finding ways to aid us, such as using pipe rollers. This is why it took us a full three days to sort and stack all of it. Yep. Uh -huh. So this is what, two days worth of moving lumber? Mm -hmm. There's even more down there? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of pine we stacked and a bunch of uh, two by eights and four by four like work lumber that we stacked. But this, I think, is all the oak. There might be a couple little ones buried in the pile down there, but this is pretty much it. So tomorrow is two by eights, four by fours, all the spruce, and, and all the locusts. Locust. Yeah. And those four inch thick slabs of locusts. <laughs> That's not how I got my foot. <laughs> yeah. But we're gonna leave that's that gonna be interesting. We'll leave a lot of that stuff there on that yeah. cribbing, so it shouldn't be too bad. This was it's really the lion's share of it. Damn, it's a lot of wood. A couple board feet. How about we shift gears now? Wes wasn't just an extra set of hands moving lumber. His carpentry skills came in handy working on setting up a blank for the aft deadwood. I just need to smooth up this one, and I think that's gonna be about spot on. And then we can move on, we got, we got some more piling up for you. 
Good. Look forward to it. We're working on joining up some big timbers to glue together for the aft deadwood. The aft deadwood is huge, um, so it's a good opportunity to use some of these off cuts from other things and glue them up together and make our aft deadwood. So we're gonna run this big, it's about a six by seven through the bandsaw here to take off a little bit and get that to be the same thickness as another big beam we have and glue them together to make one of the layers for the deadwood. And this is about as big a beam as really I'm comfortable with putting through the bandsaw in the, uh, in the way we have it set up right now. As you can see, just this gets the table rocking a little bit. Um, it's cast iron chewins under there, it's really strong, but this is a lot of weight. And not only that, just overcoming the friction to slide this across the table, even with the table waxed, it takes a little bit of effort. Um, so those folks who suggested that we cut the keel timber on the bandsaw, I just wanna say, no way, Jose. Uh, it would just crush the table. The keel timber is too long, so the keel timber wouldn't, be, wouldn't fit in the boathouse in that way. It's like 26 feet and the boathouse is 50 feet. Uh, and then just overcoming the friction on the table if the table somehow didn't break and moving that timber. Uh, it's not to say it's impossible, but it's uh, highly improbable that that would go well. Um, so although the bandsaw has this really deep throat and has this really big capacity, the real limiting factor is just how big of a chunk of wood you can fit and put through it. Um, and having the throat depth is great for cutting frames and things like that that are big and oddly shaped. And we can throw a short chunk of timber on here and resaw a really thick one without a problem. But when the beams get really long, really big, and really heavy, it's much better to bring the saw to the beam than the beam to the saw. So I'm going to quit blathering and cut this thing. So that worked well. I love this bandsaw. It's slow, it's old, but it does a damn good job. And uh, yeah, this is about as big a timber as I wanna put this through this thing. Maybe with big in-feed and out-feed tables, but even then, it's, it's, just, it's just hard to control and steer such a big beast of a piece of wood. With all our material planed, jointed, and figured out, it's time to glue them all together. The aft deadwood required a massive timber. This meant a bit of puzzling in order to figure out the lifts, not to mention a couple of days' time to simply glue them together. Yesterday we put the last lamination on the big deadwood assembly here. And this morning I flipped it over, set up some rails, and carefully rolled it forward so that it's much closer to where it needs to be. And it'll make taking measurements and transferring them a lot easier. So right now, basically the bottom is up and we'll start cutting there since that's the widest part. And eventually today we'll flip this over and do some more shaping on it. Uh, to roll it forward, I just put up some rails, some pipe rollers, and I set up uh, basically a belay to the base of the bandsaw so that as I jacked this thing up, if it really wanted to start running away, I could stop it easily by myself. Uh, so that's what that whole rope and chain thing was about. For the forward deadwood, it was really easy to test fit it, slide it in and out a whole bunch, and shimmy it down to size. But this timber is so big that we can't really do that. Uh, and the ballast casting is not 100% perfect, so there's a couple discrepancies in there that we need to match really well. So today is gonna be a lot of pattern making, um, cutting this out to shape kind of width-wise, and then I'm gonna have to pull a ton of different patterns off this ballast keel casting and use those patterns to really very accurately mac up this nib end. Because when we put it on here, it's really, we only want to do one or two test fits. Ideally, it'll fit the first time. It's just a big heavy timber and we can't move it in and out as easily as we did with the uh, forward deadwood. 
So that's the plan for today. A lot of cutting, a lot of shaping, and a lot of pattern making.